All right. <clears throat> it is exciting to be back on campus, to have an opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, I'll skip a lot of this backstory. I think uh, Dr. Little's uh, intro was great in covering that. Um, <clears throat> If you want to follow me on Twitter, just to kind of see what kind of nerdy stuff I'm up to, it's at Tom Karen. So, note on that. Um, <clears throat> I do think it makes sense just to have a little bit of information about you know the speakers, so that you know kind of who am I listening to and, and what do they know uh, about uh, what they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> as Dr. Little mentioned, I have done several tech projects. So uh, that's my bias, tech entrepreneurship. I know there's, there's more kinds of entrepreneurial opportunities out there than just tech. Um, and so hopefully if you are thinking about an entrepreneurial journey and it's not in tech, hopefully you can still kind of just translate a little bit um, from, from my experiences. I think they're applicable whether you're in a tech uh, project or not. Um, <clears throat> I also, uh, other than tech, have had some entrepreneurial experiences in a few other fields, uh, most notably recently um, in food services. We did a food truck. We have a food truck called Hooli Boys Shave Ice that my kids do uh, in the summers. And uh, stay tuned for more announcements on, on more food type businesses. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, another update on my career story, I have recently transitioned out of the CEO role at Moki. Um, and have turned the operation of that over to one of my co-founders and partners, uh, my, my former COO. Um, and I am now the founder of a new company called Spry Technology Partners, and we are in stealth mode. So I can't really tell you what we're up to yet, but maybe soon we'll be able to do that. Um, I also have served as a mentor to a, a lot of students here at BYU, um, <clears throat> and I'm currently an advisor and on the board of directors for a VC-backed company here in Utah called Vutility that does uh, analytics for the um, energy industry. So that's, that's probably enough about me. So I thought what we'd do today is cover some, some questions. Um, you know, I've been in the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship as an associate founder since 2008. Worked with a lot of really awesome student, students and kind of talking to them about their projects. And there's some common questions that I get from students um, when I have those mentoring opportunities, and I'm going to answer three of them today in the presentation. We're also going to cover some trends in technology, and I'll provide some tips on um, being an entrepreneur and entrepreneurial journeys in, in the presentation today. And I am also, um, Nate, would you mind handing me that bag? Just want to throw this out there that there are going to be a few questions. There's going to be a little mini quiz. And I do have treats for those that provide answers, especially correct ones. If you're brave enough to give an answer, we have this. If you get the answer right, we have something more like this. Okay, so that's, that's what we got going on. <clears throat> okay, so question number one, should I be an entrepreneur? This is a question that, believe it or not, I get from a lot of the student-led teams here at BYU. They have an idea, they're going through the class and the courses, um, but you know, they're still wondering, you know, is this really right for me? Should I be an entrepreneur? <clears throat> and I do not know the answer to that question, but I can provide some things that can help you process that. Um, what I thought I'd do is cast it in the light of uh, putting on your entrepreneur superpowers. So it's all about superheroes these days. Um, 20 years ago, when I graduated from BYU, Entrepreneurs were kind of thought of as dirt bags, really. I mean, they, don't, they didn't have the reputation that they do now. Um, <clears throat> now entrepreneurs are kind of thought of in, in, a, in a much nicer light. Uh, but I think that to be an entrepreneur and to be a successful entrepreneur, it requires special powers. You're going to have to put some superpowers on to be able to do it. So I listed 10 superpowers here. Um, <clears throat> you have to have all of these. The key is you don't have to be, if we were going to kind of score like Pokemon scores, you don't have to be a five on all of these. Um, but these are the skills and the superpowers that you can develop uh, by becoming an entrepreneur and going through that experience. And I would submit that these are also the things that you try to inspire in your teams um, and in your, your employees as well. So <clears throat> maybe the first one. 
kind of, you know, that x-ray vision, the ability to see the world differently. I really believe that's an important power for entrepreneurs. Maybe to see something that others don't see, to see an opportunity. Um, resilience, you gotta be able to face down long odds. I think one of the awesome things about being young and being an entrepreneur is that you don't know that you actually can't do that and so then you actually are able to figure it out. Um, passion, you gotta care deeply about your idea. Nobody will care about your idea as much as you do. Drive, that's the motivation to kind of keep going when things are hard. Character, <clears throat> I think this matters a lot, doing the right thing. I've seen entrepreneurs do the wrong thing and that really hurts their business. So I think character is one of the superpowers of a successful entrepreneur. Leadership, leadership is not just kind of talking about stuff. Leadership is actually going first yourself. Um, one entrepreneur that I'm friends with said he likes to be as good as he can be, if not the best, at all of the jobs in his company. So he's capable of doing any job in his company and then he's able to bring people in and teach them how to do those jobs. So I think leadership is kind of going first and in inviting and inspiring others to go there. Charisma, you got to be able to sell your idea <clears throat> and it's not just to potential customers. You have to sell your idea to your spouse. You have to sell your idea to your partners. And it's not just one time. Hey, we should go do this project. Um, you might have an idea every Monday that you need to be able to sell to your stakeholders, to your employees. Charisma matters. Courage. You've got to step out into the void. It's scary, right? Um, putting a stake in the ground and saying, this is what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> a quick story on that one. And uh, my first tech company, Wingate Web, which was an online event management software company, we had an opportunity to go pitch Intel. Um, Intel has a lot of tech events, as you might suppose. And so we flew down, my partner and I, we flew down to the Bay Area and we went into the Robert Noyce building, one of the forefathers of, of the chip industry at Intel. And we went into the Intel campus there, went into the Robert Noyce building, up into a nondescript conference room, and we sat down with the corporate events team at Intel. And this was a massive opportunity for us. We had just kind of come up with this new conference management product. We wanted to sell it to Intel. We started our pitch, and we stepped into the void with this woman named Deb, who was a very tough cookie, had been at Intel for like 30 years. 10 minutes into the pitch, she said, can I stop you guys? We said, yes, you may stop us. Do you have a question? She said, I do not have a question. Well, I have one question. Is this what you guys do for a living? And we said, yeah, this is what we do for a living. This is our business. We manage your events. She said, we don't need this. You guys are free to get on a plane and uh, head back to Salt Lake. So pretty rude, pretty abrupt. We got sent packing. We were only at Intel for 10 minutes. Intel hired us 30 days later to run all their corporate events globally. So sometimes it takes a little courage. You step into the void. People don't like your idea, and then they change their mind two weeks later, and they hire you for a multi-million dollar contract. Um, <clears throat> same thing happened at Microsoft, except for they didn't hire us. OK, that's courage. Wisdom, um, seeking understanding. That's a definition I put for wisdom. Um, a good entrepreneur has to be wise. And you may not know the answer, but you can figure it out. Um, do the smart thing. Strength, the power not to give up on yourself. So there's the entrepreneur superpowers. Um, <clears throat> I think I could score myself high on those at some points, and low on those at some points, but those are some of the things that we seek to, to become superpowers as an entrepreneur. Um, and this is what I've seen my friends do and, and, and be successful with, with these attributes. Um, I put a quote in here. This picture is a picture of me uh, in 2009, I rode um, a race called the Race Across the Sky, Leadville, Colorado, 100-mile mountain bike ride, 14,000 feet of elevation gain. You start, start at 10,000 feet of elevation. And I met this guy who was the race director. His name is Ken Klober. And just before the race, he was giving us a little pep talk. And for those of you that like sports platitudes, this is the one that Ken provided that gave me some motivation to finish that race on that day. He said to the racers, you can be more than you think you can be and you can do more than you think you can do. So when it comes to those entrepreneurial superpowers, if you look at that list and you feel like you might be intimidated, like, 
Wow, well, you know, I don't know what my score is on each of those attributes. Don't be intimidated. Just look at those things and think about, well, hey, where, how can I go from a two to a three on that attribute? Or how can I go from a three to a four? If you're already a five on all of those, congratulations. Um, but these are things that you can work on and you can, you can do more than you think you can do and you can be more than you think you can be. Okay, another question that I get from <clears throat> student teams a lot is, hey, should I raise money? So just informally, should they raise money? Yes or no? Yes? If you think they should raise money, say yes. yes. How about no? <coughs> who are we talking about? We don't even know who we're talking about, right? Uh, but it's the question that we get all the time when we meet teams. You know, should we be raising money for this? Um, so the answer is no. Um, investors can be a pain. You're going to suffer dilution. And by the way, spending other people's money is way too easy. I know. I raised $14 million for Moki. It was way too easy to spend their money. So definitely do not raise money. Except the answer is actually yes. Okay. Why? Well, the answer is qualified yes. Okay. First of all, if you, has a, if you have a physical product, if you're going to have manufacturing or you're going to have inventory, you are going to have to have money to pay for that product before you're going to be able to ship it. You're going to need to raise money. Um, there's lots of ways to do it. We can talk about those. Um, <clears throat> you should raise money if you need it to grow. Okay, and I put a little asterisk by that because testing your idea is not growth. Okay, I had an entrepreneur ask me, I'm doing okay here in the United States, but I'm thinking about raising a couple million bucks to go see if I can sell in China. That's not a growth strategy. That is a test. You should not raise money to go sell in China. If you can prove that you can sell in China, then maybe raise some money to go operate that plan, okay? So don't raise money to build your technology, to test your idea. Raise money to grow your business. Um, so how do you build your technology? Well, that's called bootstrapping. I can tell you about how to do that. Um, you can raise money if you're killing it and it makes sense to, to, to take some money. Okay, I know a very good pair of entrepreneurs in the Associate Founders Organization who ran a business for like 15 years before they raised a penny for that business. And they were doing really well and they took some money and now they'll be able to expand. It was a good reason to, to, to raise money. Another reason you might want to raise some money is for validation of your idea. And that may sound contrary to the advice I provided earlier where I said, don't raise money unless you've validated your idea. Sometimes the process of raising money can help you to validate your idea. Also, sometimes the process of raising money can help others to steal your idea. So keep that in mind. Um, if you go hike around with a backpack on Sand Hill Road and you try to raise money, just keep in mind that if you're asking for $5 million, they're sitting there in their minds thinking, well, what if I just call some CEO that eats nails for breakfast and I give him $10 million? Maybe he'll run this idea better than you. So be careful when you raise money. Get good mentorship. Get good advice on that. Don't raise money, but do raise money. Okay? That's my advice. All right. I've done it both ways. Wingate Web, we didn't raise any money. We had a great exit. Moki, we raised a ton of money. That company has not yet exited, but we've had a lot of success. All right. This is going to be the last rhetorical question, and then we'll get into some actual questions for the audience. The next question I get is, is my idea good enough? What do you guys think? Is, is their idea good enough? <coughs> Who's for yes, their idea is good enough? You don't know what the idea is. That makes sense. I get that question a lot. <clears throat> um, we get introduced to a student-led team, and it's what's on their mind. Is this idea any good? Um, and the answer is no. The idea is no good. If the market is already saturated, if you haven't validated your idea, if you don't have a product or a prototype and you haven't done any iterations, if you have no market knowledge or experience. So if you have an idea that applies to a market that you do not understand, like, okay, I would be terrible at women's cosmetics. All right, I don't understand that. Um, or you like uh, the salon industry, right? I don't get a lot of haircuts. So that would be a bad place for me to go. So if you have no market knowledge, no experience, that might not be a great idea. <clears throat> your idea is a good idea if you're passionate about it. 
if you understand that market, if you have market knowledge, if you've done some testing and validation of your idea, if you've talked to potential customers, then you might have a good idea. Um, and by the way, that might be the same idea that was not a good idea last week because you just hadn't validated it yet. Okay, so I might tell you that I don't like your idea, but it still might be a good idea. After you've validated it, then I, th I think your idea is awesome. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, ideas are a dime a dozen. It's what you do with the idea that, that really matters. And so keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out, is my idea any good? Um, it's not so much the idea, it's what you do with the idea that, that can make it a really good idea. Um, it's a good idea if people demonstrate a willingness to pay for it, then it might be a good idea. Um, that's, that's my criteria. I'm always into you know, validation through people. You know, if they're willing to pull their wallet out and hand money over, probably probably pretty compelling idea. Okay. So is your idea good enough? It might be. If you get in there and you roll your sleeves up and you test your idea out, then you're going to find out. Okay, you don't, you don't have to bet the farm on it, but you can find ways to cheaply, quickly, iteratively test your idea. Um, so there are some, some probably more specific things you can do in the ideation phase. And I know that you know, Dr. Little and others here at, at, the, at the university try very, very hard to teach the process by which you can qualify an idea. So I don't, I don't want to kind of get into that too much other than to say that this is really the question at the heart of, of, of uh, you know, a lot of student-led teams is how, how good is this idea? All right, let's do, let's switch from the questions to a little bit of kind of vision that I have of the tech industry. Is anybody here interested in tech entrepreneurship? Okay, cool, that's like, uh, informally, that's like a third. How about entrepreneurship in general, maybe not necessarily tech? Cool, that's like at least two-thirds. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to talk about some tech trends. Um, in the tech industry, some cool things happened. We, we had chips. I mentioned Robert Noyce and Intel. And then we got PCs and then personal computers, right? And then we got networks. I mean, my first PC that I messed around with wasn't even on a network. It was just a standalone PC, you put a little floppy drive in there. Um, then we got networks, and that was awesome because then, you know, like 11 PCs could talk to each other. And then along came the internet and the web, and I made a distinction there because the internet's kind of that thing we all connect to, and the web was really kind of all those cool sites that we go to. Um, that was a huge disruption. And then mobile devices was another massive disruption. Apps and Internet of Things. And, you know, that's kind of the evolution that I've seen in my lifetime of the, of the tech industry. Um, the point that I want to make is that great companies today are incorporating technology as part of a service. So I'll, I'll mention a few examples. Bamboo HR, um, Ben Peterson, a BYU founder. Um, it's an HR services company for small and medium businesses. It's a technology solution, but really what they're providing is the capability to manage your team. Um, and so when you're thinking about your idea, don't just be thinking about a technology. Be thinking about some problem that you can solve for, for someone, and maybe you can use technology to do that. Health Equity, my good friend Steven Nealman, they provide HSA accounts. Again, they use technology to do it. They just IPO'd Qualtrics. Again, another good example of a company that provides a capability to do kind of informal customer research surveys and it's based on a technology so you got to have both and in fact I think in most companies now in the tech industry it's not just a service it's not just software a lot of the time it's a service it's software and it's hardware all of those disciplines are involved in a lot of today's good tech products look at drones look at fitness devices look at mobile devices and IOT there's software in there there's services in there and there's hardware in there okay so that's my view of the tech industry. And, and if you're going to be playing in the tech industry, you need to be thinking about all of those. OK, and now we move to the phase of the presentation that I call quiz and prizes. So I hope you guys are ready for quiz and prizes. Um, Nate, do you want to help me with the prizes? OK, so this is going to be our tech trends review for the day. Who can tell me, based on this graph right here, this is from 1965 to 2008, and it represents a particular product. You're supposed to tell me what the product is. 
And this product achieved a high mark in like 98. They sold 35 million units in a year, and then it went away. I think this is the first hand. That is a great guess, but that's not it. Yeah. Yeah. Palm pilots, that's not it either. You guys are, these are great. Yeah. Floppy drives, that's not it. Yeah. That's not it. No. No. No, that's really good though. Yeah. No. Typewriter. Okay. Everybody who guessed on the way out, small candy bar, okay? That's for you. You guys are going to kick yourselves. Any, do you want to venture a guess? Um, I was born in 1965. So. You might not think, okay, I'm going to give you a hint. You might not think of this as a tech product. But technology disrupted this dramatically. Cameras? What kind of camera? Film cameras. Film cameras. Give the man a candy bar. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I just, we just had to kind of get back to 1965, right? Okay. <clears throat> Why does this matter? This was the most massive disruption, right? And what that means is that there's an entrepreneurial opportunity when these disruptive forces come about. Okay, let's do another one. This one's going to be a little bit easier. Okay, this product had a funny thing happen. Um, it had this big spike, and it was later. You know, it was like, I don't know if you can see the graph, but it kind of spiked up in 08, and then <clears throat> just absolutely went away starting in about 2013. Yeah? Nope. Good guess, though. So let me just throw a hint out. The last slide was film cameras. Film cameras. What disrupted film cameras? Digital cameras. Who gets the candy bar? Okay. Let's hand it. Digital cameras. So film cameras got disrupted. Then dig what disrupted film cameras? Digital cameras. Then what happened to digital cameras? Talk about a double whammy for like Kodak, right? Like. Boom, you're dead. Boom, you're dead again, right? This, <laughs> welcome to the tech industry. Anybody want to play? Um, okay, here's another one. Did we get a candy bar out on that? I don't know who said it. Who said digital cameras? Who wants to claim it? Okay. Up top. <clears throat> All right. What's this one? This one is later. So this one, in 2007, this product sold 3 million units in a year. And then it high marked in 2011. And in 2013, it went down to 3 million again, and now it's like dead. Yeah. iPod Nano. Not iPod Nano. <laughs> Blackberries. Blackberries. Candy bar. Good. OK. Blackberries boomed and went away. <clears throat> More disruption. Um, <laughs> any idea what this one would be? The red graph? Personal computer. Personal computer candy bar. What's the green graph? No. Laptops or personal computers? What was it? iPhone. I smartphone. Look what the smartphones did. Like it from 1975 to 2010, it took them that long to get to 350 million units. Smartphones did it in four years. Are we seeing a trend? What's the trend? The cycles are happening in shorter time frames. Like, products can go from zero to 500,000 units uh, almost overnight. OK, I think we just have one more. Do you need more candy bars? <clears throat> Any idea what this is? This is not a product. Uh, this is more of a service. This service went from nobody in 2004 to 1,600 million. These numbers are in millions. Social media, that's a candy bar. What was it? Facebook. Facebook, that's a candy bar for her. We got a girl who got a candy bar. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, um, that was a fun diversion. The reason I wanted to show that to you is just to kind of show you, oh, by the way, on this one, back here, the little purple line on 2010, that's tablets. And if I was to show you kind of 2010 to 2015, tablets did not do what iPhones, what mobile devices did, they plateaued. And that was actually something that hurt me very badly at Moki. Okay, Moki was about turning tablets into kiosks. And what we hoped for was the tablet market would dwarf the mobile market, and it did not. And, you know, in 2010, it looked like it would, okay? But it didn't, and it, it hurt us. Um, so I have personal, uh, personal kind of experience with how these, these uh, disruption graphs can, can really uh, affect your life. All right. <clears throat> So um, I think it's kind of fun to look at, you know, the disruptive forces in technology. You know, you guys are pretty used to it. You live in a world where a new product comes out and millions and millions of units are sold. Um, you know, there's some great examples just here in our BYU community. Um, a student-led team did a company called Owlet. Um, I had a privilege and opportunity to mentor those guys early in their process just a little bit. I'm not taking any credit, any credit for any of their success, but it was just kind of fun to see them at the stage where they were asking those three earlier questions. Should I be an entrepreneur? Is this a good idea? Should I get funding? I worked with those guys just a few times when they were asking those questions. And now they're projecting sales, you know, in the millions of units, 20 millions of dollars. We live in a world where if you get a disruptive product in play, there are billions of consumers for those products and the opportunity to build a massive business is there. So the tech can be really fun, can be really scary, can be really interesting. Um, and I think it's not just tech. I think this kind of disruptive, crazy, turn the world on its head worldview is, is it goes across not just tech. Um, for example, if you think about millennials, millennials, they, they don't have as much brand allegiance as maybe their parents did. And they really don't care about brands. In fact, a lot of them hate the current brands. So what's the opportunity to sell to millennials? And what kind of products do they want to buy? And how do they want to get influenced? Probably in radically different ways than um, any of this other previous stuff happened. So the, the opportunities to do entrepreneurial businesses that could be massive companies, um, you know, they're, they're still out there. All the good ideas have not been taken. All right. So this is going to be my last slide um, entitled Five Tips Where There's Ten Tips. That's a little boo-boo there. So there's actually ten tips. All right, so if you have taken the red pill and you've decided that you want to be an entrepreneur and you're going to do a project, here's some stuff for you to think about. If you're going to do your project here in Utah, you should understand your local ecosystem. If you're going to do your project somewhere else, you should understand that local e ecosystem. Okay, so if you think that, let me just throw an example out that would illustrate perhaps what I'm trying to say. If you think that you're going to build a social media company that's going to knock Facebook off, is, it pro is Utah Valley probably the right place to do that? Probably not. Uh, where would you go to do that one? Silicon Valley, okay. By the way, don't do that one. I would uh, highly, highly recommend you not approach that one, okay? Uh, so what are we good at in Utah? Um, I'll throw a few things out that I think we're pretty good at in Utah. We're good at business to business uh, technology. We're really good at that. Business to consumer, I haven't seen as many great examples. A few. Business to business technology, all the examples that I provided pri prior in my presentation where I said Bamboo HR was doing a good job, it's business to business. Qualtrics, business to business. Health equity, business to business, okay? We have a track record on business to business software and SaaS. What else are we fairly good at here in Utah? We have a lot of students at BYU that have had international experience, maybe they've been on a mission. What are those guys good at? MLMs. Uh, I'm going to say sales, okay? Um, we, we, are, we are good at MLMs, unfortunately. But um, 
sales. We're good at sales. Look at inside sales. Look at um, the pest, pest control companies that have been successful here. One of our um, entrepreneurs in, in the founders organization, um, David Royce, just sold a pest control company for more than $100 million. Um, we're good at sales, okay? We have a lot of people in Utah who've had an experience that is unique to someone their age. Most people that are 22 or 23 have not lived somewhere for two years, you know, um, going out and knocking doors and having conversations with strangers and selling a product that's kind of hard to sell, okay? Um, so my super, super cute daughter, Kylie, just got back from Ukraine as a missionary. Was it always easy to approach people in Ukraine about the LDS church? Not always easy. Almost never. Almost never. First of all, Russian, right? Second, you got you to tell them about something that they're not used to. Um, now, it's a great message, okay, but it's hard to sell. So, we're good at sales. Think about that. If you're thinking about a company, a marketing company or something like that, Utah's a good place. Um, there's lots of other great things about the Utah ecosystem. Uh, my second tip would be think beyond campus life. Um, if you have an idea that serves the college community, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, that's a good idea. Go run that project, see where it goes, good on you. A few of those have gone really big. A lot of them end up being a kind of a learning experience. Personally, I'm interested in ideas that kind of are outside the campus life, okay? If you think about a business idea that ha can reach several billion people, that's way more interesting than a business idea that just, you know, kind of reaches your, your college community. And of course, the thing that proves that I don't know what I'm talking about is Facebook started out as a college thing, so maybe I'm wrong, okay? But I like ideas that think beyond the campus life. Um, number three, understand that failure is part of the process. You have to fail. Absolutely, you have to fail. If you don't allow for failure in your company, in your organization, you won't have any creativity. Um, if people are too afraid to fail, then they won't put any ideas forward unless they know that the idea will work. The key is to fail fast, to fail early and often. Um, one just really quick super nerdy example of this, um, <clears throat> the US NASA space program pretty much is organized around guaranteeing that we'll have minimal failures. Okay, we've had a few failures, but really in the United States space program, in NASA space program, failures are highly frowned upon. They won't fly a mission unless there's a reasonable, um, you know, suspicion that they can succeed, okay? The Russians, on the other hand, they flew rockets that they knew were gonna blow up, okay? In fact, they're like, we'll blow 10 of these up, and on number 11, we'll get where we wanna go. Um, and during the Cold War, they developed a rocket engine that's about twice as powerful and as efficient as any technology that we have um, in, in the United States through the process of blowing up rockets. And the reason for it was they knew that their rocket engine design, it injected air into the combustion chamber in a different and novel way. They knew that it was more complicated. They knew they were gonna blow up rockets. They did it anyway. They ended up with a better product. So my, my kind of advice there is don't be afraid to fail. Just be ready to fail and pivot really quickly um, and make the changes that you need so you don't fail again, learn from it. Choose partners and employees wisely is number four. Look out for overlap. What I mean by that is, like, if your best buddy is the same as you, you're in the same major, you have the same ambitions, you and that person, him or her, you might not be the best business partners. It might be better for one of you to be, like, the tech guy, one of you to be kind of the sales guy, maybe get somebody from the business school who understands finance. Look out for overlap. That can be a problem, especially when it deals with ambitions. Watch out for egos. Check those at the door. I can tell you that my own personal ego and the ego of my partners has not been something that's helped us in our business endeavors. Um, make changes when needed, early. If you think there's a problem with an employee, with a partner, change it. If you let it go, it'll ruin your company. So uh, I speak from personal experience there. Um, make the changes that you need to make in your partnerships. 
in, the, in a kind of lean startup movement, there's this mantra that you know, um, a startup is a temporary organization in search of a repeatable, scalable business concept. And what that means is that your employees, your partners, everybody, you personally, you're temporary. If the company rapidly changes to become something that's not a fit for your partner or for you or for your employees, make the change. If you don't, it won't work. All right, number five, take care of your cap table. Um, I see a lot of messed up cap tables from student-led entrepreneurial teams. A cap table is basically the industry term for a spreadsheet that uh, shows who has equity in the company and how much they've invested, okay? So when I say take care of your cap table, I mean uh, don't give your uncle 10% of your company for 50 grand, okay? Um, now, maybe your uncle's a really nice guy and he happens to have 50 grand, but if you give him 10% of the company for 50 grand and then you come to me two weeks later and you want 100 grand for me and you're gonna give me 2%, that's not gonna work, okay? So get good legal advice. Don't mess up your cap table. We don't have time to really get into a conversation about cap tables in, this, in the course of this conversation, but watch out for your early valuations. I had a couple entrepreneurs come to me with an idea. They had not sold anything. This happened like three weeks ago. They shall remain nameless. They're great guys. But they thought their company was worth $5 million. And they had a $5 million valuation they were asking for. They hadn't sold a single product. In fact, they hadn't even manufactured their product yet. I don't think their company was worth $5 million. Early valuations should be low, okay? Watch out, watch your early valuations. Number six, timing matters. The first mover is not always the winner. The reason I bring that up is you might think, well, my idea is no good because, like, well, what if Mark Zuckerberg said, this won't work because MySpace has already got this, okay? I think that proves my point there. Product readiness, don't launch if you're not ready. Outlet. Man, those guys drove me nuts. They were slow getting their product out the door, but they waited until they had their ducks in a row, and now they're doing pretty good. Um, if they had over-promised and under-delivered in that case, they would have been in big trouble. And that brings me to over-promise, under-deliver. Um, so this is actually advice. You should over-promise and under-deliver. Sound like good advice? What about Elon Musk? He just did it. He just promised the world fully autonomous vehicles by the end of next year. He's not gonna deliver on that. Why could he do that? He could do that because what he's talking about is the vision, okay? So my advice is, when you're talking about the vision of your company, you can overpromise and underdeliver. When you're talking about the execution of your company, meaning selling stuff, dealing with customers, you should underpromise and overdeliver. And I realize that those two pieces of advice are in contrast to each other, but I, I believe that they, they can be, and they, they, you can be, it's okay to have those two things in conflict. Number seven, have fun. Brain science and brain studies, and I'll show you references after if you're interested, shows that we are more creative and productive when we are having fun. Um, if you look at little kids at play, they're super creative. Then you bring them into a classroom and you lock them down to their table, and you put their worksheet in front of them, the creativity is gone. So um, you can't fake this. It can't be like a fake fun environment. You actually have to be having fun at your project. And if you are literally having fun doing what you're doing, that is so um, attractive to your employees and to your customers. Um, if you are having fun, then your team can have fun. If they're having fun, your customers are gonna have fun. I can't stress this enough. I think if you're at an organization and it's not fun anymore, it's broken. It's badly broken. You gotta fix it or you gotta move on. Um, number eight, manage your stresses in healthy ways. I've seen entrepreneurs try to manage their stresses in unhealthy ways, get some exercise, you know, spend time with your family. Be yourself. The best entrepreneurs aren't trying to fake it. They're just being themselves. And do things in the right order. And the right order is test, iterate, and execute. And then rinse and repeat. Test, iterate, and execute. I think we're out of time. I want to thank you guys. We have five minutes. Um, I think we do have a Q&A session afterward for those that are interested. But if we have just a couple minutes, um, 
I'd be happy to take a question or two. Any questions? Yeah. So you mentioned the ecosystem. The yeah. Your ecosystem. My question is this: for a lot of us, we're in, in college, we're here at BYU, right? Right. So we can't like. What if our ecosystem isn't necessarily here? Would you suggest testing, perhaps here, um, while you're still in school, while we're doing this? Because obviously we don't have the means to go to Silicon Valley or to New York or something and just start up a company before you know we're out of college. What, what would you suggest? You okay. So the question is. How do I test my ecosystem if Provo is my world, but my business idea is not Provo? Exactly. Um, <clears throat> maybe you can find a way to test it here, um, but you're gonna have to go validate that it really works there too. Um, and, and so, um, you know, the college community is a, actually a really great place to test ideas out, but you're gonna need validation in, in location as well. Um, you know, the person-to-person -person banking system that works in Zimbabwe is going to matter here, right? And so you got to really understand your ecosystem that you're building your product in and that you're selling your product in. Um, I do think that there are great ways to test, test your idea and validate your concept here, uh, but it's going to take you know, work in, in the field as well. And what I really mean by this is just more the idea that you should understand your ecosystem. Like, you know, I don't know anything about Eastern Europe. I probably, you know, shouldn't be building products for Eastern Europe. Um, I understand Western Europe pretty well, South America, and Asia. And so I, I know I can, I can go into those markets. But also to understand, like, the ecosystem of where your company is located. Like, there's, there's really two questions. One question is, do people want this product? And then the other question is, am I the kind of guy and do I have the kind of team where I could build that product? Like, is that within my reach? Is my idea a good idea? And is it an idea that I am actually capable of executing on? I think that kind of goes to my ecosystem comment. That's a really great question and a hard one to deal with. Probably maybe one more question. Um, so you hear a lot about validation, like validating an idea, validating by pitching to investors. How would you suggest, and I think this probably depends on the idea itself, uh, we would go about validating an idea as um, how do you validate an idea as a student? Um, <clears throat> it starts with talking to friends and family about the idea. Um, it starts with validating it to yourself, like, do I really love this idea enough that I'd be willing to, you know, kind of lay my life down for it, right? Um, and then you go out from your circles, right? And then you, you but you've, eventually you've got to get to the customer. The ultimate validation is when you talk to a potential customer and they say, yeah, I'd pay for that. Or they actually make a commitment to pay for that. That's when you really know, okay, we've got something here. Like that Intel example, we felt a little bit not validated when they sent us packing after 10 minutes. And what we found out later is they actually just had this MO where they throw the vendor out of the airplane in the first 10 minutes of the conversation just to see if you bounce and stand back up. That's literally what they did to us. They're just like, okay, we like this guy's idea good enough. We don't need to hear the pitch anymore throw them out of the airplane, and then see if when we call them back if they're even nice anymore, right? So just because they say no might not mean the, they don't like the idea, but really the ultimate validation is will they pay? And will they put money down or make a commitment to pay? That's, that's how you validate an idea. So that's, it's hard, right? Like it goes back to that student ecosystem, but you got to get the money. You got to have some sign of money to be validated. Maybe one more question? Okay, we're done. Great, thanks.